right, so thank you for joining us, Caesar. Uh, we appreciate uh, the help you've provided for the test. And uh, why don't we start with you just introducing yourself, uh, telling us a little bit about how you got into the uh, business of supplying armor and uh, you know what your, how your interests formed. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Caesar Zhang. I basically started as an archer, a traditional Chinese archer. I shoot with uh, Sam Zhou. That's about 10 years ago. And then about seven years ago, I started to uh, grow some interest in uh, traditional Chinese armor because, because back then there, there was basically nothing in the market, nothing. Uh, the, the study was ch of Chinese armor was very limited back then. So, you know, I started this business kind of uh, also as my personal interest to, to the study of armor. And uh, throughout the years, uh, we've, been made, we've been making some progression in understanding the structure, the build, and the, the, the overall knowledge of, of armor. And uh, who, are, who are some of the um, collaborators you work with on your end? I, I work with um, my, my tailor and a few different uh, smiths, armor smiths. Uh, they either, some make lamellar armor, uh, some with a, a forge helmet. Uh, and uh, together with my tailor, we, we can also make burgundy. Now is the kind of overall aesthetic and design, uh, how is that influenced by kind of historical depictions? We try to uh, go as historical as possible. So these are the points that um, we worked with uh, a researcher and a couple smiths to kind of recreate. So you want to talk a little bit about the, the shapes, Justin, and the original um, inspiration? Sure, yeah. Um, so there are three shapes here. The top is a chisel shaped. The middle, we, we colloquially call it the leaf-shaped, uh, but I think the, the, the Ming archery manuals call it the, um, the eyebrow, it's like the eyebrow-shaped arrowhead. And then the bottom one was generally called a armor-piercing type in the Ming sources. I think they, uh, they may have a hard time go through the plates directly. But they would uh, certainly have a chance to uh, shooting at a certain angle, and this especially due to the the structure of the burgundy. You know, if, if you can rip off the rivet, it can go in, if, and the, because the burgundy is overlapped a little bit, so at a certain angle, if it goes through the tech, it goes through the fabric, and it may it may go in. Right, and uh, so. First, we thought we'd bring up a uh, scroll painting titled Pacifying the Rebel's Victory, uh, in which Ming soldiers are depicted wearing brigandine. So let me, let me share that. And Justin, you can chime in here if you want to give any context. Yeah, my understanding is that this painting came from the later part of the Ming Dynasty when brigandine armor was more popular. And this is just a depiction of the soldiers wearing brigandine, uh, performing various military maneuvers. Either here you see, you know, some are archers, one's holding a musket at the very top. Um, others have melee weapons, a squadron horseback, uh, some engaging with archery from horseback as well against their opponents. Then more depictions of archery with soldiers wearing brigandine. Uh, many of these of these uh, opinion did not come from me, but from uh, a friend, uh, he, or by the name of Hao Jin. He, he's another admin of uh, the Chinese Armor Group. I talked to him, and he, he did an excellent study of the whole subject, uh, the Min, Min Chinese Min Dynasty armor and the, the origin of brigandine. So basically, according to his study. Uh, first, let's talk about the Ming Dynasty. According to his study, the brigand in, in historical records first came out in 
early 15, uh, or sorry, early 1420s. It's quite early. And they, they were mentioning a blue armor. Uh, and later the blue armor were, were referring to uh, the armor made with blue clothes and with plates behind. So that's the 1420s. And the earliest finding that we know so far of uh, the Ming Dynasty breeding, uh, breeding armor was actually a very interesting one. It was uh, found in uh, General Mu An's uh, uh, tomb in Nanjing. And uh, it is basically a mixture of brigandine and scale armor. You know, some part of the armor has uh, has a brigandine riveted, has the place riveted behind the textile, behind the fabric, and uh, on a, especially on the, on the face, on, on, on the helm. And the body was made of scale armor, which is kind of, uh, the plate is like brigandine, but, but it was uh, laced together uh, probably on a backing, so so that's a traditional trans transitional Burgundy armor. And around around the uh, early early 1500s, so the early 16th century, uh, we can probably say that Burgundy has become very prevail in the main army. So after that, everything was mostly Burgundy. And about the origin of brigandine, it's kind of uh, unclear right now. Um, the earliest finding of uh, actual brigandine is from a uh, late 13th century uh, Mamluk uh, fort uh, in North Africa. The, but that one may be on a different lineage of the Asian brigandine because it, it looks kind of a European. The armor arrangement was a kind of European. And on the Asian part, uh, the earliest uh, pictorial source is from the, uh, the Eocanate. It's about you know, 13, 14th century. The earliest actual finding uh, is, is slightly earlier than the, than the Ming Dynasty was. It was uh, around the 14th century, mid 14th century, late 14th century. And they, they were all mostly in the Northern Asia part, you know, in the modern day uh, Tuvan Republic of, uh, of Russia. They found a lot of those uh, things. And the interesting finding that we, observation that we made between these armor plates and the main place is that the main place probably because they were officially made, they, they were like uh, uh, made by the government in mass production. So they were quite, uh, the shape of the, of the plates were quite irregular, you know. The armor would usually have a would be open in the center, and the place would be arranged in a in a in a standard manner. But but in the north in the North Asian part of Brigandine, they, they were kind of uh, more personalized. You know, they, they don't go with a, a uniform design, a uni uniform arrangement arrangement of plates. They will have a different shape of plates. And they will be, you know, somehow riveted a uh, full on a, on a on a on a fabric, just just to make sure it covers. And they, they don't they don't go for a, you know straight opening. Sometimes the opening can the opening can go this way. Uh, that's that's interesting. Find a way we made. Okay, and I do have some uh, pictures of antique brigandine that I can bring up, and if you want to um, say anything about yeah. those. So just feel free to chime in on any that you feel are relevant. Yeah, so, so this is a, a commonly seen, uh, mostly contributed to late Ming Dynasty. And it, it, it's probably a rush production. Uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can see that the plates were, were, were like kind of flat and the, the coverage of the, the plates uh, is, uh, uh, is, is kind of small. They, they don't cover the, the part below the waist. Yeah, this one's probably, this one's from Korea and uh, probably not iron plates. Uh, in Korea, they use uh, lacquered uh, uh, pig leather. You know, uh, a few layers of uh, lacquered pig leather, quite, quite tough material to, to make burgundy. 
And uh, yeah, the, this, this is a Qing Dynasty Burgundy. Uh, government uh, mass production, probably government sample armor. They, they send to different uh, workshops and you know, they, they are supposed to uh, make according uh, to, to these samples. This is, this is a lack. Yeah, so it's interesting that there see, seem to be subtle differences, um, you know, depending on where the armor is found. Yeah. Do you think these evolved mostly due to aesthetics or maybe limited resources or did it depend on station? I think so. I think uh, the, the most important thing is, uh, you know, the, 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 the practical, practical sense of the, these things. Uh, they, these are these are armor. These are things that need to be uh, to be produced and used. So they would go with whatever resource they have, and uh, the, the 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 going for the looking for the for the you know for the beauty of the armor may come later. You know, but the first thing is, is the practical use. Now this this one is a uh, is first. It's a very well made brigandine. You can tell from the place. Uh, it's very shiny, you know, because they spend many a lot of time to to uh, to polish it, so it can, to, so it can stands well against the rust, and uh, the the shape is a kind of a the bow shape in the center that make, makes it, it stronger against the against the strikes, and uh, yeah, and and this this is probably a late Ming Dynasty, early Qin Dynasty period armor. And uh, the the fabric uh, definitely stands out, I would say, from the others, and, and just its complexity of design. Yeah, uh, from what I know, these uh, these were found in a Tibetan monastery. So, so yeah, it's quite, it's quite unique the, the the pattern on on the on the fabric. And would that point toward? Um, Kind of the armor being commissioned for for someone of high rank or high high resources yeah I, I think so i think so how about this piece yep. here this is a uh, um this is a uh, um, early Qin dynasty armor maybe maybe Kangxi, maybe you know definitely before uh, Maybe Kangxi period to early Qianlong period. And here we just have an individual plate. Yeah, that's the individual plate from the uh, the sample armor, the, the, the Qin Dynasty sample armor that you showed before. So I thought we'd uh, transition a little just to give uh, some context for where the panel you provided would have uh, provided coverage here. Um, so it would have been this thigh and potentially knee area, depending on the height of the wear, I believe. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, theoretically it, it, sh it should cover the knee of the wearer. Um, the recent funding shows that, um, especially these armor in the picture, they were, uh, they were made in the 18th century. They were, they were ceremonial armor, but uh, they, they came in uh, different sizes to feed the person. Now, I, I uh, thought the, the fabric on the panel you provided was particularly striking. Is there any significance to this pattern or color here? Yeah, this, this pattern, uh, according to uh, Song Dynasty's uh, resource, it's called a swords pattern. Swords means uh, interlocking pattern. I mean, it doesn't necessarily refer to the male armor, uh, but it was a it was a popular pattern that was used in China throughout, you know, as early as maybe Tang Dynasty to the Qin Dynasty, and it was also used somewhere else in the world. It's a design pattern mostly. I think. Was there any significance to um, the, the colors of the fabrics? 
Um, we were try when we make this, we were trying to mimic the late Qing Dynasty ceremonial armors, the color. They were like a bright yellow color. Yeah. And also, oh, I have to add to that this kind of Y shaped pattern in the Qing Dynasty, in, in early Qing Dynasty, they were waved by hand and it was very expensive. So it, wasn't, it was only reserved to uh, uh, the princely uh, rank. And also, uh, in Qing Dynasty, they have the emperor and they have the, the emperor's brother, were mostly made, made into prince. You know, those high ranks would, would use kind of this pattern. But in late Qing Dynasty, probably because introduced introduction of, uh, of foreign you know, uh, machine works, you know, machine made textile, this kind of thing were, were this kind of pattern were made cheaper. So, so the officers would also have it. Now, when it comes to just kind of the mechanical aspect of, of brigandine, what are kind of the um, benefits and or disadvantages of, of kind of the uniqueness of the interlocking plates? Yeah, firstly, I think the most important part it's, it's from my, from my, you know, our, our practice, you know, our, our experiments. It's also based on the historical sources. Brigandine is much lighter than, than, than the lamellar because they have less, uh, because the plates are bigger and the overlapping is, uh, is smaller. Over the overlap left part is smaller. That means the overall weight is much, much lower. For example, uh, uh, one suit of a uh, Hong Tai Chi's uh, armor uh, from the Forbidden Mu Museum in China was uh, weighed at 12.5 kilograms, including helm, body, you know, the legs and arms. That's quite uh, light. And uh, a, so, uh, early, uh, a, Ming dynasty, a mid Ming Dynasty source from the early 1500, they say uh, they, they made two sample armor. Uh, that weighs about 18 jin. Now, one jin in the Ming Dynasty was uh, 600 grams. So that's about 10.8 gram, 10.8 kilograms uh, for the for for the for the suit of armor. And the helmet was uh, 2.5 jin. So the whole thing is about you know uh, 11 kilograms or 12 kilograms. So that's much lighter. And because the size of the plate is bigger. Uh, it it has more, um, it has better defense against the concussion. You know. but the disadvantage is that I said because the plates were not laced together, there may be gaps, you know, in certain angle, so that the arrow can easily uh, goes in. And the reason for that would just be that that would um, impair the flexibility, I guess. Uh, yeah, because because you have already because the plates are big and you you, you rivet it, it behind the fabric, and and if you, you also want to uh, lace it as the you know the, in the rows as the lemon armor, it, it would be not fitting to the body. You, you want to do that on a smaller on, on smaller plates. Well, we we appreciate that and we appreciate your help you know, in, in providing the armor and your expertise here. We, we really uh, want to thank you for taking the time out and uh, collaborating with us. Um, you're welcome. And thank you for putting up this test.